OK, hi, everyone. So thanks for coming. So who here has the iPhone 7? Really, no one? <laughs> no one. OK, great. So according to Apple, this gadget can do a lot of cool things. It can see with its two cameras. It can hear conversations and verbal commands with its audio gear. And it can perform calculations and store and transmit information. Now, because it was designed by humans, we know exactly how it's built, how it's organized, and most importantly, how it performs all of the calculations needed for it to work properly. Every bit of hardware, all of the dimensions, and all of the connections have been precisely detailed and designed. And what's more is that a new version comes out almost every year, right? So who here has one of these? OK, really? <laughs> OK, well, they, it actually does something pretty similar. It can see and hear and perform calculations and store information. But what's amazing is that from the start of human civilization almost 10,000 years ago, this brain hasn't changed that much. It, um, we still only know a little bit about how it works and how it functions. We know the basic structure and organization, but how it functions, how it performs calculations, and how it stores information is still a big unknown to us. So we all have smartphones, so why are we interested in studying such a complicated thing? And that's because, as humans, we want to know who we are. And simply put, we are our brains. So higher order functions like our personalities, likes and dislikes, memories, thoughts and dreams, and the ways that we communicate are all arguably the things that uh, identify us as individuals. And they all depend on the different functionalities of the different parts of our brain. So how does one organ perform so many different activities? And as neuroscientists, this is what we are trying to understand. And before I show you one of our approaches, I first want to talk about how we studied the brain in the past. So in the past, when our ancestors came across something that they didn't know, I like to imagine they did something like this. They took a stick, and then they poked it to see what happened. And using a similar approach, uh, we learned what parts of the brain performed what functions by essentially poking it and seeing what happened or more exactly by observing what happened when a certain part of the brain was injured. Uh, for example, if you injure this part of the brain, you might lose your ability to speak. And if you injure this part of the brain, you might lose some kind of memory. So from collecting decades of this kind of information, we're able to get a pretty good map of what parts of the brain performed what functions. But the problem is this information is quite static. So just because, for example, we know what part of the brain is involved in speech doesn't mean we know how the brain uses this area to make speech. So things like deciding what to say, what language to say it, how loud, how to move your mouth, it, it gets very complicated. So to understand how the brain works requires us to identify the connections between the different parts of the brain and how they work together. So let me give you an example. As you're sitting here trying to listen to me speak, let's say that there's a mosquito flying around, so it's really annoying and you want to kill it. So what happens in your brain? Now first, when you see something, your visual cortex is activated, and then your auditory cortex is activated when you hear something, and then your inferior temporal cortex is activated when you identify this flying object as a fly, which then activates your amygdala because you hate flies, they're so annoying, right? And then your frontal cortex is also activated when you decide to kill the mosquito. And then your motor cortex to help control your, move, uh, your arm so you can finally smash it. So it's, it's pretty crazy, right? Something as simple as wanting to kill a mosquito is really not that simple. And it's actually much more complicated than what I've shown you here. But the important point to this example is that it's the connections between the different parts of the brain that allow us to have such complex behavior like trying to kill a mosquito. So how does your brain make these connections? So your brain is made up of a bunch of special cells called neurons. And they can store information and transmit information from one another via an electric signal. And to do this, neurons form very special structures. So here you see one neuron, and this is the cell body. And these black branched structures are called dendrites, and they function as the signal receivers of the neuron. Uh, 
And this long red structure is called the axon, and this functions as the signal sender of the neuron. So the place where an axon touches or makes a connection with another neuron is called a synapse. And these are specialized structures that allow the transmission of information from one neuron to another. Now, the special shapes of these dendrites and axons allow the neuron to make multiple synapses with multiple neurons, forming a really complex network. So this is quite a simple overview. I want to give you a little bit of a sense of the scale of the network that we have in our brain. Okay, so the adult human brain has about 86 billion neurons. And if you imagine that one neuron is the size of one grain of rice, then 86 million neurons could fill an Olympic-sized pool to about my shoulder height. And each of these neurons can make hundreds to even hundreds of thousands of synapses with other neurons, uh, forming a really complex network. So it's estimated that maybe there's 300 trillion synapses in the human brain. So with such a complex network, how do we make the correct connections when we have so many neurons? And there's a lot of factors that determine how a neuron makes a connection with another neuron, but today I just want to focus on one thing, and that's cell shape. Okay, so your body has many different cell types, and they're all kind of this similar circular or square shape. On the other hand, your neurons can make a huge diversity of shapes. And here are a few examples. And again, the black are the dendrites, or the signal receiving part of the neuron. And the red is, are, are the axons, and they're the signal sending part of the neuron. Now, the different shapes of these dendrites and axons affect the way that these neurons can make connections to other neurons, and can also affect the way they receive signals and integrate signals, and how they process and send signals. So you can see actually how studying neuronal shape still looks pretty complicated, right? That's why in our lab we like to simplify things a little bit, and we like to focus on this neuron, and I'll show you why. Okay, so this is a 3D reconstruction of our model neuron. It's called the Purkinje cell. And these can be found in the part of the brain that controls fine movement, which is great because if you uh, disrupt this cell or you poke it to see what happens, then you can see defects in things like movement and balance. And what you see here is mostly the dendrites of the Purkinje cell. And unlike other neurons, these dendrites can form a unique flat structure. And this allows the Purkinje cell to make very specific and precise connections with other neurons. Now, if you look at the Purkinje cell from the side like this, normally, it can make a connection with another type of neuron that looks like this. And actually, one Purkinje cell can make connections with many of these neurons, but I'm just going to show you one for simplicity. And these two guys make a single synapse. And this is the important point. For proper signaling and function of this circuit, these two neurons should only make one synapse with each other. Otherwise, you're going to have problems in things like walking and balance. So you can see how the flat shape of this neuron, of the Purkinje cell, can help facilitate this. Now, if the Purkinje cell was not flat and instead was growing in three dimensions like some other neurons, then in this case, these two neurons are going to make multiple synapses with each other, and then you're going to have problems. So this is a really great example that shows how the shape of a neuron affects the way um, that it can precisely function. And we like to use this model because it's quite simple. And we already know kind of what kind of connections it should be able to make. So we can focus more on how the neuron makes the shape so it can make these connections. So I want to introduce to you one tool that we like to use. It's a very powerful tool. And it's called primary cell culture. And it's essentially like growing a brain in a dish. And what we do is we can dissect out a part of the brain and dissociate it into single cells, and then put it in a dish and let it grow for a couple of weeks. And what you get is something like this. So the neurons grow in a single layer, so they're quite easy to observe compared to trying to see into someone's head. And what's great is we can even watch them develop from the start. So neurons begin as these really simple round cells, just like any other cell in the body. And after a couple of days, you can start to see the dendrites and the axons start to develop. And later on, these neurons can even make synapses with one another. 
So you can see how this is a really powerful tool for us because we can simplify the processes that are actually happening in the brain so we can easy, easily see and in more precise detail study um, specific parts of the neuron. So I want to show you two different ways that we can use these primary cultures. Okay, one is computer modeling. So one thing that these primary cultures are great for are for taking time-lapse movies of real growing neurons. And we can measure things like the speed of their growth, um, the probability of adding or losing a new branch, then the size and the shapes of these branches. And with this information, we can um, determine the rules of how a neuron forms its shape and how it makes connections with other neurons. Um, and then we can make a computer model like this. Now, working with other labs and collecting more information and modeling multiple neurons, we're hoping that computer models like these will allow us to maybe in the future predict how some parts of the brain are formed or how neural networks are made or maybe even to connect this to more complex behavior. Okay. Another good thing these primary cultures are good for are for studying neuronal diseases and disorders. So in many cases, a neuronal disease will show changes in neuronal shape and ultimately affect how neurons uh, connect to each other. So in some cases, in, um, the neuron will show decreased dendrites and decreased synapses, like in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. And in other cases, you'll see increased dendrite formation leading to incorrect synaptic connections, uh, like in some forms of autism or spinocerebellar ataxia. So we want to study these diseases and we want to study how they develop, how to treat them, and maybe even how to prevent them. But the problem is we can't just take these neurons out of a patient, right? And we probably shouldn't test new treatments directly on a patient either. So what can we do? We can go back to our primary cell culture. And we are now able to specifically mutate any type of neuron with the exact mutations that you would find in a patient. And we can study how the neurons develop um, and how they grow and make connections with other neurons and see what's wrong with them. And what's great is we can also see the effects of things like gene therapy or drugs or maybe even changing the condition of how the neurons are growing and see if this can change the neurons back to a healthy state. And we can do this without having to do it on the patients first. So you can see how this is a very important tool for us to study how the shape of a neuron affects its function in the neuronal circuit. And personally, I'm really excited because the models that we have now are really simple. But as we collect more data and we better understand the rules that determine the shape of how a neuron grows and how it makes connections with other neurons, then we can go from something like this to something like this and to have a better blueprint of how our brain works. And then maybe then we can even answer the question that I started off with and understand who we actually are. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>